Uh, good day, everybody, and uh, my podcast uh, fans out there. <laughs> Hard to imagine that you have podcast fans. Uh, welcome back to the podcast. Um, we are back from the holidays. We just finished and uh, put up on the website um, Barb Jackson, which was a great a great interview with a pioneer and, and a really good friend. And guess what? We have another pioneer this week and a really good friend um, who is an incredible friend, actually, because we did this last Thursday uh, without me pushing the record button. And it was one of the great conversations of the Western world. I'm so sorry that you can't hear that conversation, but we're going to try to reprise it. So joining me today is Mark Sichi, who is the uh, director of all things technological and cool uh, in the video AI, artificial intelligence, connecting information, cool technology stuff um, at HOK. Uh, in Canada, and I think internationally. Um, he's internationally known as a BIM guy. He serves on the board of BIM Canada. Um, he's been recognized for the work that he has done in this field, which I think is really post-BIM. I mean, we're really moving past just building information modeling, and we're really into information modeling, how it works and where we get it from. And I'm just happy as a client that not only did he spend two hours with me last week, but he's agreed to do it again today. So, Mark, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thanks, thanks for the introduction, Dick. Uh, obviously, hindsight is twenty twenty, so it, it means uh, I'll be able to answer probably with significantly more brevity than I had uh, in in the prior <laughs> session, which is probably a good thing, I think, for everyone. I don't know. Brevity is not one of the one of the highlight values of, uh, that I like to I like to underscore. This is, um, you know, really as I've I've said before. We lost Greg Howell a couple of years ago and he was really the great storyteller in our community. Mm -hmm. And we lose stories if, um, if we're not out there talking about them. Right. Um, this guy, Claude Levi Strauss, uh, who was a, um, uh, an interesting scientist back in the day who had engaged in all kinds of uh, anthropological studies said that you know history really in the Western world is our myth creating. And so I think these things are really, this is how we create the myth in our community and in the built environment. So thanks for doing it again. So be as long-winded as you want to be because those no, are I, stories. I think it's, it's fantastic. I think, uh, you know, last time we started with kind of like a, a brief introduction of myself and a timeline of kind of where I came from. And, you know, again, um, I'm just a, a bunch of things are popping into my mind as we're chatting here. So maybe I'll just do a direct dive uh, into Please. where we started. Yep. Um, you know, I think last, uh, last time we had a conversation, we and you and I have uh, had lots of many conversations, uh, you know, with pizza and beer and wine and all kinds of great things uh, in the past, um, is uh, really, I think my trajectory, if I'm being perfectly honest, is uh, started um, at like nine years old. <laughs> I kind of had a concept and an idea of what I wanted to do. And that was to like create things and use different ways and means and methods of actually creating them. What I didn't realize at the time, I guess, because, you know, you're so young is how many different aspects, uh, specifically when you speak to things like construction, right. Um, and, and, you know, physical buildings, um, how many different aspects and things you need to know in order to do that. Um, you know, so early on, I guess at a, at a very young age, I had a, a concept of fundamental understanding that it needed to be something that was creative, um, that involved thinking differently about things. As I kind of progressed, I, you know, I moved into my formative teenage years, I would say earlier on, um, you know, I, I did something very strange that's unusual, I guess, for a young person, which is to create my own business. And really, that was like the antithesis of everything that my mind was set up for, which was like this creative realm of like drawing using your hands and very analog method of working. Um, and it kind of introduced me because I mean, you have to understand this was, I don't know, like 30 years ago now, <laughs> more. <laughs> well, um, and I, well, my first job was 60 years ago. So okay, I'm, well, right, I'm right there with you. Okay. So, you know, computers weren't a thing, uh, let alone some of the other things that would come with doing that. And, you know, I primarily had like one or two clients. So to say that it was my own business is probably stretching the truth a little bit, but you know, people were paying me to do things. Right. And, um, you know, one of them was a customer I had, which was a HR consulting firm. Uh, cause my dad, um, uh, you know, he's, 
historically, uh, he went to school for electrical engineering, but then uh, spent the entirety of his career thereafter in human resources. Hmm. And so, you know, I ended up doing what at the time I didn't realize would become a thing that is ubiquitous now, which is developing PowerPoint. <laughs> Presentations, <laughs> right? It was a thing because you know you're that the point, guy. You're the guy yeah. that invented death by PowerPoint. Exactly. Oh my and, god! And if you, you think about him. it, you know, like how were things done back then? Um, I mean, I went to school and we had slide carousels. That's what you did when you had a presentation, <laughs> right? I had you think film strips that had a record, yeah. and it would go ding when the professor was supposed to move the yeah. film clip up. So exactly. I'm with him. And there was that like clunky, like right when it would switch the yeah. frames. Anyhow. Um, so this was like a new concept at the time. People were like, oh my God, this is the future. I mean, I guess they didn't know that it'd be a horrible future, but you know, there you go. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I ended up, but, but, you know, I guess the thing was, is that, you know, in order to technically, the point here is that, you know, there was um, a platform software framework, whatever you want to call it, that was kind of designed by people who had no real fun or fundamental understanding of like how you could creatively use this thing to the fullest of its potential. It was developed by people who are functionally driven to say, we have a need here uh, and a purpose. Here is a tool for you to achieve that. And, you know, um, by extension, you know, you had to understand, understand how to use a whole bunch of other things, right? Because, you know, you're going to, when you create something and you're telling a story, you're developing a narrative, you need to develop visual content in order for people to, be for, first of all, for it to be engaging and also for people to understand what it is you're trying to say. I've always been a proponent of leaning on the side. And I mean, people disagree with me all the time, but I always come from the perspective that I think people should instinctively be able to look at something and understand exactly what you're saying, whether it's an image, a collection of images, a picture or drawing something, they need to be able to see the intent, the narrative by looking at what it is you're giving them, as opposed to spelling it out and putting the words, right? Because I always right. find it more engaging when people are speaking and telling the story and you've got something that evokes emotion out of you, like some kind of imagery, whether it's good or bad, you know, um, right. and then you go from there. So, well, it's uh, all of these, you know, all the research indicates that people cannot multitask despite the fact that they think that they can. So yes. they can't listen to you and read the words at the same time. Exactly. I mean, it's just impossible. So you're absolutely right that the graphic has to be the message, right? Yeah. And so at a very young age, I understood that, I guess, is the point here. Um, I was just lucky enough that people paid me to do that. And um, the funny, I mean, the thing that I, I find humorous now is the fact that once I started doing this work, I was actually provided with equipment. You know, today, if you're working for other people, you know, you have expenses and overhead, like I got to go out, buy a computer for me to do the work, I, a couple of other right. things, right? But I guess, you know, people probably felt sorry for me as like 14 year old kid. I mean, at the time, a laptop period cost like five, six grand. Right. And this is like, oh, yeah. whatever, 1980 something. So somebody gave me a brick and said, OK, help <laughs> us out. So I did. Um, now, I guess the simultaneous and parallel stream that was a kind of at odds with all of this, like technical creative design aspect is something you and I have discussed and chatted about, obviously, previously, which is sport. Right. So in parallel to doing all of this, I was playing a very high level of hockey, um, right? Um, Semi-professional at that point. What you need to understand though, is that my parents only, my mother only allowed me to play hockey at 10 years old because she was afraid that I would get hurt. You know, but the second that I kind of stepped on the, on the ice at 10 years old, and I was like at least 12 to 13 inches taller than every other kid, that should have been a sign for her right. <laughs> that, that I'm okay. Yeah. Never, nevertheless yeah yeah who's the, who's the uh, who's the big tall guy uh who plays for the boston bruins oh is it in he actually got traded to washington um like seven foot 12 or something yeah well, six foot seven or something like that before skates and then with skates you know add another three four inches so he's like seven feet tall seems like he's bigger than dikembe mutombo yeah sure. <laughs> so oh it's right. it's so you were the uh, chara of your day it, well, yeah, I mean, yes and no. I mean, you know, the thing is, is that uh, I think, you know, what I got out of the experience is that it, it ramped up very quickly, right? So there's a, a very high degree of competitiveness. Uh, the same is true for anything, right? Anything you're being paid to do, the expectations are super high. The only exception to that, I would say, is probably the Olympics, where the expectations are very high. The money comes from other means or methods. You're not necessarily, I mean, you're being funded to participate, right. compete, and, you know, thing ancillary methods and means of, uh, you know, like endorsements and things like that are kind of, I, I guess, essentially where you might make your money to support yourself beyond that. 
And what's um, quite funny, I think, though, is that how disconnected money is really from your performance. Right. I mean, people land these giant contracts. The expectation is huge. And yet, once they've landed the giant contract, you know, they're set. And so, you know, from a from a motivation standpoint, they're motivated only because they, they want to win the game or they want to play the sport or they want to do really well. And money's kind of out of it. And I think the same thing is, you know, happens in our industry. People think that you can motivate people with money. And really money is like the worst incentive ever. Um, so it's interesting that you say that. And, and just to fast forward a bit, you were actually playing with Dale Howard Chuck's nephew. Nephew, yeah, that's right? correct. And yep. so that, that led to uh, an, an incredible part of this story. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. So, I mean, you know, we wondered, uh, when I say we, you know, my family essentially wondered how, when the call came from the U.S. to go to, uh, you know, um, what eventually would become an NHL tryout camp, um, how the hell people ever knew that some, you know, 15-year-old uh, kid from Canada playing uh, Junior B or Triple A. Uh, was should even be considered for that like how was anybody watching uh, it was something that was like so far off my radar I just went out and tried to have fun right and do the best I could right but yeah as you said I mean as it as we found out uh, one of the kids I was playing with on one of my teams was Dale Towerchuk's nephew and so uh, he he said to uh, one of his ex-coaches who is actually now if I'm not mistaken the director of development for Hockey USA <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> um a very nice gentleman, actually. Um, he he suggested that oh, yeah. I go ahead and uh, come down for the tryout. Came down to the tryout. You had to actually prepare a PowerPoint for the tryout. Was that? Yeah, no, not really. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah. So I mean, uh, I, you can imagine there's all sorts. I, I think what that whole experience taught me was that um, I needed to make a decision uh, in my life, right? Either I was going to, you know, because you see all sorts of things like I, I, you know, I had the distinct advantage of being extremely young and having looked forward, uh, being able to see what my life potentially could be by the time I was 23. Wow. Right. So it's like almost 10 years ahead. So I'm competing against guys that are like men, right, mm -hmm. fully developed. And I'm a 15, like I'm tall, but I'm little comparatively speaking. Right. And mentally, my head is in a different space. So I got to see my life like 10 years in advance. And I, I you know what, that, that was the fundamental, like, like uh, clincher for me was the fact that I was not going to be 23 years old <laughs> and doing this because, you know, yeah, you've, there's a huge variety. And, you know, when you see the numbers and they say like 1% make it, and then of the 1%, it's less than a quarter percent that actually have more than a five-year span career. Those are scary numbers. Right. Mm -hmm. And you think, what do you do with yourself? Like, what do you do when you're mid, late twenties and then you start life over? You know, I was just lucky. I had, uh, I had another option that I was very, very passionate about. And so ultimately after I ended up getting hurt, uh, which is what actually kind of also aided in cutting my career in that regard short, I decided to commit, um, to going through essentially what became almost a decade of school. <laughs> But it, but it should be noted that you did become one of those 99 percenters where yeah. you actually got to play for the Boston Bruins in Boston Garden against people who wanted to kill you. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've been really lucky. I've been able to play, you know, at the original Boston Garden, um, MSG in New York, uh, Air Canada Center, essentially in Toronto, uh, which would be much later with a bunch of fellows that we all played junior and, and professionally in some form or another. Um, I've, I've been lucky like they're they're the experience of that is just absolutely uh i would say humbling because when you play on something at that scale there's like i think really there's like one or two people either you're the kind of person that is like very thankful for and are able to really kind of soak in everything that that means right, right. and it and it you know it drives you from a humbling perspective or you're the kind of person that's like yeah i deserve this i mean i am awesome yeah. um i'm gonna go crush it Right. I'm obviously the, the, the former rather than the latter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that, that's, that's, it's, it's really refreshing. I mean, I think it is, um, it's remarkable so, that you've had success at the highest level in a couple of different, you know, completely different venues, completely different uh, directions. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's, you know, when you succeed in, to some degree in, in, 
in these sorts of ways, it actually makes defeat that much harder. So when you face challenges and you immediately don't get, or you're not the best at something, or, you know, you don't get the thing that you think you deserve, it's actually so much harder to suck up (laughs) because it almost has come naturally for so long that if the expectation is, is that you will always achieve, you know, your highest uh, possible uh, degree of any sort of measure whatsoever. Yeah, I can Um, understand that that's been kind of, my life too in a much you know right smaller little farm that's <laughs> corner corner of the farm but yeah it really is um it, it's it's daunting when you thought you were going to reach a pinnacle and you were all prepared for it and you loaded up the team and you got the best sherpas and the weather's clear and you, you don't get it it's yeah. like oh nuts man and i guess you know that um, my, my, my uh, post-secondary education. So my, my bachelor's degrees and my master's, um, you know, it taught me very, very quickly. Um, I, we discussed this actually previously is, you know, one of my first weeks or second weeks at, you know, uh, in school, uh, architecture school, you know, I posted some stuff on the wall and I got shredded in half. Yeah. And that was one hell of a learning experience. Like, Rarely in my entire life, even with all that I had been through, through sport, had I ever been that brutally destroyed by another human being so uh, than in that, like than in that moment. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually reading a series of essays by a, um, a Belgium architect called Four Walls and a Roof. Yeah, you've heard about that book, but it's a it's a lovely exploration into the dashing of expectations <laughs> from okay. architecture school to actually practice in architecture. So. Yeah, I feel so bad for you. Well, so, I mean, and, and that, you know, it's not the way I would do it. But I think, um, again, there's uh, people out there, right, where you either can fold on the, in, in those situations or, or they stimulate something inside of you that motivates you to crush right. it or, or prove that person wrong, I guess you could say. Um, and, I, you know, like hindsight, uh, the, the individual and that experience was like humbling and thought provoking and also taught me a lot. Right. And it was valuable to me, regardless of how negative the outcome may have been at the time. Um, but essentially, it led me to down this tunnel of chasing technology, um, not for the sake of proving people wrong to say that technology would be the future of the profession, but to say that technology would play a major role in our understanding, execution, and thoughtful um, development of all aspects related to buildings uh, and beyond uh, in the future, right? Um, and I, you know, I think now. I don't really need to say I was right, but I mean, it's become obvious that it's just a tool uh, for us. I mean, if you're smart, you're smart and you use your ingenuity, your expertise, everything that you know, and the tools that you have. And it's just a really good tool to help us investigate, explore. Uh, I will say that I also had, um, I was very, very lucky in the sense that, you know, throughout my graduate studies, I was very lucky to work with some of the smartest people who are, are uh, who are really the founding principles of, um, you know, the origin of like computation and what BIM was before it was BIM in architecture. And, you know, some of those people, you could say, like, if you look at an architect's perspective, Bernard Schumi, um, you know, um, and uh, Peter Eisenman. Um, I mean, I, I, I might mention Frank Gehry, but his process is actually more analog and then post-digital. Um, but these are people, you know, like Eisenman and Shumi were the ones that were kind of um, using digital tools at the front end, uh, Greg Lynn, and, and being heavily criticized for their means and methods. But at the same time, I got to work with people and, and learn from people like Chuck Eastman, uh, who's since passed on, who was really one of like the godfathers of, you know, digital design. And, you know, this was, I think, a year ago or two years ago, where, you know, some of his ex-students and colleagues threw a massive conference, and it was phenomenal. Um, And also, one of my professors at Waterloo, late Thomas Seabom, you know, he worked with Chuck directly, and, and to have access to these people to understand fundamentally, like, these are individuals that grew up in a punch card system environment, right, mainframe, IBM mainframe, and saw the entire trajectory of what computing became. Um, that was extremely rewarding to be able to have access to those individuals, learn from some of the things that they saw and, and, and beyond, right? That, it's unparalleled. Yeah, it, so. it, it's funny because when I was a kid, you know, the FBI with Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. was on 
And it opened with this scene of a giant Univac computer processing all of those cards. And when I started off life as a lawyer, there was an IBM typewriter <laughs> you could put those little cards into and yeah. remember that's how yes. you were, you know, word processing formats, right. basically. So yeah, it's amazing that you were there with the the and it, the folks that stood at the, the bend in the trail and went, wow, we could probably do better than this. Absolutely. And I mean, I think one of the greatest things is you know, founding and and grouping together, getting together as as much as um you know, uh, professional service firms are competitors. There are a number of us that, you know, kind of came to throughout this that have very similar stories to my own, maybe just like minus sports. They're arguably much smarter than I am um, in the industry, but they're very close friends of mine. And we all kind of grew up together and we all work at different firms. We all have different concepts of, you know, what is a good use or development of technology and how it relates to our profession. But the thing is, is that we're all still in the same profession. So working together, regardless of, of where we work and still pushing it forward through things like conferences, symposiums, um, you know, really kind of um, thinking outside the box and what is the future going to be, um, that happens as a collective. It's not one individual or uh, perspective that solves that problem. And I think one of the things that's so refreshing and how the conversations that you and I have is actually the practical application and what does it mean beyond design, right? What does it mean in construction? What does it mean in terms of uh, supply on demand, um, finance, uh, all of the aspects of building that traditionally, well, I mean, let's be honest, architects have no training, really, nobody ever really teaches us how to be good uh, accountants, which is probably very, (laughs) and in some cases, um, but yeah. You know, it's, these things that are really part of the process that they didn't teach you how to be an accountant. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, exactly. Uh, um, so, yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of that, a lot of exposure. Um, you know, I was very lucky again to have my own company, um, you know, about eight or nine years ago. Uh, that was was originally started as kind of a design slash uh, consulting firm, but then eventually morphed into a go between people who have equipment that make things and people who create ideas uh, because there was no one in the middle. There was a there was a real hole in the industry where nobody understood like the whole vertical. Right. There were people at the at the bottom and at the top. And. There was that whole middle bit that was missing and, you know, where you get material from, where somebody sources and originally processes that material so that someone can post-process that and then install that. Um, None of that, nobody was filling that gap. So uh, I learned a lot from that Uh, originally or sold half that company to another company um, and, and grew that to the extent that I could grow it. And then again, move back into like a proper firm, uh, about four years ago. And from there, uh, after two years there, I joined HOK. And ever since I've been with HOK, it's been, um, again, a humbling and a, and a great experience because lots of smart people. Uh, and I love working with uh, people that challenge you on a day-by-day basis, clients, colleagues, whatever you call it. So I think that's one of the great things about um, this aspect of the business is that you know people think about technology. And so whatever it is from an espresso machine to a driverless car to a, you know, P6 a scheduling tool. You know, mm-hmm. all of these things are parts of the broader technology. But where you get stung, I think, is that when you let the tool drive itself, yes. you know, like, like a P6 schedule comes up with all kinds of linkages and cool things that have nothing to do with actually how we build mm-hmm. buildings or estimation software that, encrypted inside that estimation technology are actually really bad numbers and bad data that's not updated and doesn't really help you. And unless you can kind of look inside of it and see how the machine works, which I think is really at the heart of what, of, of what you do, you actually use the tool. You don't just turn the tool on it and, right. uh, and go home. Although there is this new, have you heard about this Hilti machine that puts in yes. while you while you sleep? <laughs> I like that guy. <laughs> I, I I can't tell you how many Hilti anchors, epoxied Hilti anchors. I've, I've, like, I've had the purview of, of either doing a site review for or seeing the process about a million times probably. So oh, that's fantastic. Does it work? 
Um, well, I haven't, I'm not talking specifically about the machine. I'm talking about the way it was done before the machine. So I can oh, imagine yeah. what the positive and tangible benefits of doing that are when it's oh. not necessarily a human being that's doing it. So yeah, just, just the fact that some guy is on a ladder looking up with it's a crazy. drill yeah. is nuts. Yeah. Yeah. I so have seen I, that. I, I was going to say, I've seen that done with a, uh, eight by 12 hollow steel section custom formed. And uh, that is three stories long with uh, two armatures extending out to a floating slab. So a guy hanging off the edge of a slab on a ladder, not in a boom for whatever reason, while trying to drill vertically, filling a hole with a uh, epoxy and putting in an anchor um, for a piece of steel that big. So it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And, and then these guys hop around the, the floor on their, on their ladders. They don't even get down from the ladder. Yep. They just skip it across the floor. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, but it's funny what you said about the collective, because I really do believe that, you know, when I was at LCI, one of the things I was really proud of is that people were willing to share their stories because right. they figured they had more to learn from sharing than they did from just hiding and doing the same old thing. And so it's good to know that there's a community of folks out there um, that you think are smart because if you think they're smart i think you're one of the smartest guys i know so that just kind of blows me away maybe uh, i just come across that way <laughs> um i'm afraid of getting checked into the boards so, well know, no, I, I just actually i think where uh you know, these things you're talking about, um, it goes back to what I said, actually, originally, what I didn't know at a young age, but was uh, subconsciously um, being taught was the fact that, you know, all these things we have are created by people that don't necessarily do with the thing that they're creating, which is kind of right. crazy when you think about it. Um, but um, I actually think that it's a, it's a massive opportunity for us because, uh, you know, one of the big things is that, and, and you know, I, I kind of feel very strongly about this is, um, you know, I really think you need to know what your tools are capable of and whether or not you need to customize them. Right. Um, a perfect example of that is even woodworking or hand tools. There are ways to add and augment and, you know, install extra armatures, say, for instance, if you're using a chisel and you want to put a stop on it to prevent you from going a certain depth into the wood when you're working on it. That's the exact same thing as, you know, modifying a piece of software to do something very specific uh, that is related to the task that is at hand, right? Uh, right? Same sort of thing. You're putting a slight customization on it to sharpen it, uh, no pun, pun intended, uh, ensure to, uh, ensuring to make sure that it is doing the exact job you needed to do when you need to do it. Which is really the, the purpose of tools, right? I mean, right. This, is, this is where we have taken the technology that is P6 and we've dumbed it down in a sense. I think we've advanced the technology by using stickies. Right. Say, okay, I, I don't have time to, re, to revise a 25,000 activity schedule at night, every night when it's proven itself to be wrong. So why don't I just move a sticky? That'll help us kind of advance the ball. So I think it is use what, what you need. It's the same with a lot of the tools that we use. You know, we start with templates, but that template uh, falls by the wayside right out of the box because this is not the same thing Agreed. that we designed the template on. So, Well, that is a challenge we face uh, in, in our industry specifically is that uh, there are a one-handed kind of can count on one hand uh, a case where you have common types um, where they're just, you know, rinse, repeat uh, sort of scenario, right? Uh, arguably, maybe one of those is you know, class A office, uh, certain sorts of multi-unit residential where, you know, uh, someone, a developer will sit down with you and say, I want to build six of these. Right. Well, that's, I mean, when you think about that on a large scale, that is not like 200,000 cars a year. <laughs> that is still exactly. single digit number of something that is quite large. Now, there may be thousands of repeatable aspects of those, right? When you think of, if, say, for instance, there are 22 story towers and there are six of them and there are whatever, uh, 200 suites per tower times six is, you know, you do the math um, and so on and so forth. There's scale there, but it's not scale like you get in other industries where you're talking millions of items uh and so that's that's a major driver and and it's an impediment sometimes to how fast we can accelerate because a lot of people talk a lot about the lack of productivity uh, and advancement in construction but a lot of that has to do with when you really think about it at the end of the day 
a lot of the costs are being driven through the floor and there really isn't the same kind of scale there are in other uh, sort of manufacturing driven industries. Well, it's funny that you say that because the, the hallmark of my work, the thing that the, the big discovery that I made somewhere along the way is that work can only go as fast as work goes. I mean, right. you can probably take, uh, you know, 45 seconds off how fast it takes you to hang a piece of drywall if you spend five months trying to figure out you know, your real tack time for, for doing that and figuring out these assemblies. And yet the thing that costs us the most in construction is the space between the work. Right. It's going to the truck to get your thing. It's rework. It's, it's exactly the fact that, that material didn't arrive in time to be able to do stuff. And I think that that's, it's probably true of every industry. It's the, you know, when architects ask for 14 days in the AIA contract to respond to an RFI, it's not because it takes 14 days to respond to an RFI. It's because there is so much waste in the system that there's space between when it gets to them and when they have time to do it. And it's removing that space between work that's really what productivity is about. Right? I, I honestly can't agree with you. Any, 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 I honestly don't know what to say. Like what I, when I think of these sorts of things, especially the situation you just described where you say it's the between a, a aspect of things, think of, I, I, I just, I keep coming back and I know sometimes it's a bad analogy in a place to put your mind to think about things like automotive, but I'm just, I think there are a lot of strategies and things that can be learned with what happens there. Like for instance, uh -huh. You, first of all, you have stations, right? You have stations where equipment is brought to you. Right. So you're literally working with the material as it, it, it is provided to you. You're never out of material. You're never short of material. You're never wondering or questioning what's next because it's there and you know what your job is. Why, why has no one decided or developed baskets of contents, uh, shipping container warehouse offsite that has all of the parts that are required for X, Y, Z components or areas of a building? Uh, within that are baskets. Those baskets get dropped behind the drywall or the electrician or what have you. Or maybe it's one guy that can do all trades at once. Oh, my God, what an idea. Okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to cheer you up here. Southland Industries in the States, and there's a number of these. Uh, right. See Dean. Sasco, yeah. uh, on the electrical side. Um, what Southland Industries does when they do ductwork in a building, mm -hmm. that ductwork is created in their in their fab shop straight from the right. model. It gets shrink wrapped and put on a pallet. It gets lifted onto a truck at seven o'clock in the morning. That that pallet that that pallet of work is going to be installed. It's delivered with a boom crane through the window and put at the site of the work. And when those guys are done, they go home. Right. And that's the work that they do for the day. So. So we are moving toward you know, something like that. Well, what I was going to do is I was going to actually draw on a reference from a project I worked on in 2008. Okay. How, I don't know, nice. was that four, 14 years ago, yep. 14 years ago, we built, uh, it was a, uh, again, it was class, class A office tower in Calgary, uh, something like 36 or some odd floors. Um, washroom unitization built fabricated completely mm -hmm. finished everything off-site plumbing electrical everything was integrated with hookups on the outside literally like a shipping container built a frame for the thing built everything inside of it right. put them on trucks craned them into the building slid them in we made sure we did uh scanning at that time of uh you know right. where the concrete was how many millimeters were out slid them in through the building envelope put them in place on wheels, drop them down, hook them up, done. Uh, 20, uh, 290 units or something like that. Um, that was whatever, 14 years ago. And I think to myself- How long did that project take from uh, beginning to end? Uh, we, had, we had a three month window to get it all in. Um, I think we did it in two. The thing that took us the longest was, uh, <laughs> ironically, was <laughs> buying a plant we literally just built, bought land with, uh, you know, like a Costco like structure yeah, yeah. Um, and developed uh, and, and drilled into the floor uh, railroad tracks with a giant gantry and had stations set across uh, what was like 500 feet. Uh, and we just moved the things along at station X. You added this. It was literally an automotive replicated an automotive kind of approach to assembly. Then they went at the end, they got picked up by a crane stuck on the truck at whatever, two, four at a time, sent all, driven all the way out and then installed on site. That's fantastic. Um, and I, I just, 
I find it like some of the things I've been involved in in my career, I just, uh, you know, it, it sometimes I think, yeah, people are right. I mean, like, how come we don't do this? Like there was less, less risk in doing that, right. <laughs> less time. Well, and, and really, I mean, nobody is, nobody is, um, is organized to do that, right? Nobody, it's, it's never anybody's job because my job is drywall or my job is right. sheet rock or my job is, is the sheet metal. Um, or my job is to organize the trades and yell at them. You know, nobody ever thinks about the conception. And one of the things that your buddy, Ben Fairman, who's the director of Canadian design for HOK and a good friend mm -hmm. of both of ours, uh, often says is, how did it happen that, that we don't get to do means and methods? <laughs> why, why as architects don't we don't get to think about how things come together? Because that's essential to what we think about in terms of the built environment. And he right. and I were thinking about doing CLT, student residences, doing exactly what you're talking about. You know, kind of a sponge form structure that you're building these things in the lobby <laughs> of the right. building and they go through three or four stations and they go out and they just plug and plug and play. Well, that's that's exactly how we did um, Lansdowne Stadium in Ottawa was uh, everything was completely digitally driven. We had, uh, uh, because capacity is a real issue, and well, I mean, it was at that time, and it still is kind of now, but capacity is a major issue when you're thinking heavy timber, right? Because there's only so much um, hardware and so much plant space you can have. It takes a lot of space to build big stuff, right? right. Um, yeah. We had a place in Oregon manufacturing uh, wooden glue laminated together timber purlins, um, 2,000 2, of them all uniquely shaped at each end. Wow. Um, so we relied on a model. We literally fed our model into the machine, developed the G code, which is just the fancy way of saying the machine code that the machine uses to actually cut the angles. Um, sent that out to Oregon because they were the only ones that had capacity to do 2,200 of those things. Mm -hmm. The primary members were split into two sections so that they could fit onto a truck. Those were uh, milled and cut in Minnesota from timber up north uh, in Minnesota and shipped uh, to Ottawa. And then all of the metal that was done was fabricated. Uh, they, we had these metal connectors. So we designed three different types so that it would accommodate every single bend and turn scenario on each of those 40, uh, 400 angles from the Perlins uh, joining right. to the members down in Minnesota. All the parts got shipped to, uh, to Ottawa. And then we had uh, all of like an instructional set of IKEA assembly documents that mm -hmm. people were trained on. So they knew how to put everything in place. I, I mean, like how, how much more can you, and that was me, like an architect running an architecture firm, um, getting that stuff together, preparing that methodology. I mean, like, it, it seems to me like we're so well suited, <laughs> suited to problem right. solving in this way. Well, and, and there are, you know, there's a company uh, in the States run by Todd Zabel, who's another smart right. guy that I had on the podcast a few, uh, I think series six or seven or something. Uh, but Todd talks about production planning and he talks about using logarithms to actually schedule every single day. You know, don't worry about a big schedule. We will right. go out there and we'll see what work was done yesterday. And overnight, we will give you the next production plan since you're constantly thinking about production. Mm -hmm. And so whether you, you think about, you know, we, we, we get very almost prehistoric when we talk about target value design and, well, we should be designing to a budget. And you go, well, how do you do that exactly? You know, how do you really know that? Well, if you design in a model and the model is loaded or can be loaded with costing information so that you know that at every, every beam you put in, every you know, elbow you put in, everything happens, there's a cost associated with it that's just adding up over on this side. You go, oh, that's a little costly. I wonder if we could do something else. And you start flying through the model, moving transfer slabs around. Right. There's a lot of money to be saved in that without compromise, with actually making the building better. Mm -hmm. And and not costing, uh, you know, an arm and a leg because you're thinking about these things ahead of time. I mean, that's at least in the construction area. That's one of the most useful things I have seen um, through modeling. I used, I was asked to be an investor in Synchro. If you've seen oh, that, yeah, yeah, that guy yeah. back in the day, and I was going, wow, this is really cool. How much money do you want? Are you nuts? Um, yeah. Probably should have done that. <laughs> it would have been smart. <laughs> well, I I think uh, it kind of brings me back to you know the, the concept that um there's a there's a huge opportunity there's also you know what what's perceived I, I think what maybe one of the major hurdles is uh is the perception of of a serious amount of risk right um i think 
as like a software developer, you can kind of remove yourself from the risk associated with getting numbers wrong to a certain degree, because, right. you know, you have all these license agreements that basically absolve you of any responsibility of error uh, right. to, the, to the, <laughs> yes, exactly. To the degree that, you know, like a client could come sue you and say, well, these guys use your software, uh, you know, I'm going to sue you because it's like 30% more than the software calculated. Right. So right away, like you take ownership and then, then of course it's onto the like professional to, to absorb that um, or the, or the construction manager and notoriously, you know, like uh, GCs and construction management, uh, construction managers, you know, it, they're like, get me away from risk. <laughs> it's like the first right. thing. It's, which, is, which is so weird. If you think about it, I mean, they started tearing down the, Waldorf Astoria in New York uh, in January of 1931, I think it was. And the Empire State Building built on that site opened that following May. Right. And these guys didn't think about liability and risk. They thought about, let's build a building. Let's get this thing going. Let's make it happen. And, right. you know, it was unfortunate five people died when they built that thing. So, of course, you want to be thinking about human risk. But, right. you know, market risk and all that other stuff that people are always trying to sell, yeah. the people that make all the money in the world are the brokers that are in the middle of transactions that never do anything except put people together exactly. and make you feel like, oh, God, no, there's a terrible risk here. You better spend a lot of money with my guy, you know, to cover that risk. And, and that's, I, been, that's yeah. been true since Lloyd's was founded when they were insuring ships. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I was just going to say, like, I would argue... Uh, I could argue um, that software companies are almost like uh, they're like the direct modern contemporary replacement for that in the sense that they provide a tool or a service or a thing um, that is in the middle where they make all the money, but they have no risk. <laughs> they actually make a thing. I mean, I know. Golden, Goldman Sachs don't make anything. No, you're, I know. You're, I get your buddy down at, you know, my little house real estate company doesn't make anything. Um, and banks don't make anything. They just, no, and you know. I guess where I was going with that statement is that, you know, um, I think historically and some of the things you may have seen, you know, in the news with uh, 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 some dissatisfaction with maybe some of the individuals that provide those services and that mm -hmm. software um, is actually kind of um, incumbent upon us, I, I feel, as a profession that we're partially responsible for letting it get that way, right? So right. the fact that we've kind of stepped away, from, this brings me just back to that note that the fact that we stepped away from one another and have actually, you know, have let competition, er, competition rather, stifle progress by some means, um, you know, I think it's time that we kind of like get, get together, work together, not necessarily to, you know, replace or develop because I, I don't like that's not our job. Our expertise is not developing software platforms. I mean, there's a reason why these guys exist. But, you know, there are, again, back to that tinkering aspect of things, customization, really like the specificity involved with very targeted applications of things. That is our area of expertise. And I don't think we can actually address that unless it's all of us like kind of holistically. And when I mean all of us, I mean like anyone who has a seat or stake at that table, not just like architects, engineers, um, but again, no, back to that whole notion of everybody owners, else. Contractors, users, yeah. you know, people who live in the community. I mean, there's a Agreed. big stake. The customers for this are huge. And I, I think once again, it goes back to how cool the automotive industry is because they do a lot of and stuff as opposed to or stuff. Like right. they build a car very efficiently, but yep. it also answers consumers' needs. I mean, Agreed. cars do more things than you even think they do, <laughs> you know, more than you can even know. Uh, and they're doing it all the time. And you go, wow, this is this is really amazing. Well, they're more computers now, I guess they are almost as they are cars, right? Um, right. So are, you have to. Yeah, they're, they're, they're their own network, right? Yeah, I was just actually going to draw reference to a book I've been reading recently because, you know, I think there's a lot uh, you may have you may have read this one. Um, and it's one that I've actually heard quoted by a, a number of people. By any means, it's not a new book, but it's just one that I've been rereading because I think I've read it like four times now and I'm still missing stuff. So maybe I'm not as smart as you say I am. Um, <laughs> but it's uh, it's it's entitled The Future of the Professions, right? Um, written by uh, Richard Susskind and Daniel Susskind. And really, it talks about um, and I, I don't necessarily agree with the position, though I think things are starting to even trend the way that they predicted, which is to say that um, the commoditization of the service 
that professionals and any service provider, meaning like lawyers, um, architects, uh, professionals who provide a, a service uh, to other professors, to I mean, it's the yeah, same thing there. Um, are, are essentially going to be blown out by technology because uh, there will be many aspects of technology that will replace a lot of the traditional means and methods in which they've kind of executed traditionally over the last century or so. And I think you can argue that's somewhat true, but the reason I disagree is because I I think that we, I think it's a bit pessimistic. I think we actually have a lot more to offer than that. I just, I don't think we're very good at recognizing that. Right. That well, I, I, I think, you know, my, my thing has always gone back to the 80s with Reagan and Thatcher and the idea that the market could take care of everything. Cause I right. started practicing law before that happened. And I, and it, and it, it you know, it was, it, it wasn't like the greatest thing that you had to join an all white male country club to entertain your clients, to be able to get clients. Right. But there was something about being a professional where making money wasn't the wasn't the be all and end all of what right. you tried to do. You know, there were things that you like fancy lawyers who would get um, you know, very successful would become judges because that's what they own to that's what they owe to the profession. And that, you know, we don't see that when everything takes a market turn. And I think the Suscans are really moving in that in that direction. Agreed. Agreed. But before we get too far afield. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The the there's, there's so many things. I mean, we could go on for hours and hours and hours. Um, but I, I wanted to make sure that we we did talk about um, kind of where we are with with BIM since you sit on right. the BIM Canada board and especially in Canada and and in North America and kind of worldwide. So so where where are we on it? I think last time you said you know you got to concentrate on the I, which is the information. Right. Building. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, historically. Um... If you think of the the again the tools that have kind of like historically defined BIM and and where we've come from, um, really, I mean, the major advantage of BIM, if you think about it, and it's it's fundamental basis is really the third dimension that we're getting now. And I I, I used to always argue and and you know uh, say that that third dimension almost comes for free, right? We're we're largely kind of um, executing the same process in the sense that we're drawing lines or elements, um, you know, compositional elements that essentially define space. Um, but, you know, the advantage now is, of course, the fact that when you draw the thing looking at it flat, orthogonally, like two-dimensionally, you're actually getting a vertical height with that, right? And with that then comes things like where slabs and walls interconnect and what that geometry looks like. So you can kind of you know, you could argue it's inherently more productive in the sense that you are always working from many different vantage points, which is something you had to manually operate historically in the past, right. whether it was hand drawing or not. I think I had mentioned last time that, you know, I'm probably the last generation, I mean, I, who had personally submitted a set of hand drawn uh, drawings to the city for approval for a per building permit right. and not, not for like, you know, uh, a house, but for like an actual like academic building. post yeah, yeah. institutional building. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, I mean, and it's just, you know, the things you learn, it's like, you know, people used to call me like, uh, I can't remember the nickname they used for me, but it was just, I, I was a, a fast drawer ink on mylar. I was like, and I would just scrap a whole 24 by 36 sheet start right over in like a second. Um, I love but that. yeah. And so, you know, I think the state of BIM now currently is that finally it's progressed beyond its infancy of like representation and its aspect to be able to do drawings because I would say that one of the major benefits, you know, right off the bat that we got with BIM was the ability to coordinate our own sets of drawings and the content within them. So stupid, silly right. things like, you know, level indicators, uh, grids, um, notes, annotations, dimensions. These are all things that instantaneously you could standardize and there was like very little margin for error in the sense that they were consistent throughout an entire drawing package. I think that in and of itself was like, a, everyone was like, my God, thank you for bringing us this thing, right? Um, obviously, that didn't come with a ton of growing pains. But I think we're now in an area, you know, where we've moved well beyond that. Um, and we, you know, when I say we, I mean, like, I mean, everybody, um, clients included, you know, like uh, owners, what have you haven't fully realized the full advantage of back to the eye, right? Which is absolutely, I still 100% affirm that it is the eye that is of utmost value in this whole proposition is the information itself, the data. 
um, that is, we still haven't found a way to extract all of that and what that means for us in terms of um, the entire process from conception, um, schematic to operations and, uh, and handover and what it means to actually manage the life cycle of something that's been designed to operate for 60 years, right? It, right. It's baffling to me that we, um, we put so much energy into the capital process, the capital expenditure and the initial process and not about the longevity and the, and the fact that it may take five years to build, but it's going to exist for like almost 70 or 60. Right. That it's, that it's just crazy. And, inf and, and the information that you need for that is, is almost readily available. Yes, I mean, We it were is. talking last time about, you know, innovation comes from low associative barriers that, right. that you don't ever say uh, it's, you know, a unicorn is impossible because maybe a horn could, you know, be on a horse you know yes, no. exactly um but it's those people that have those low associative barriers and the cool thing i think about technology that we were your technology specifically we were talking about last time is that you can run so many different combinations of things so quickly yes. yep. that if you extend those parameters this is parametric modeling you extend right. those parameters out you can still run all those computations and you be, you can begin to see even if you have high associative barriers <laughs> the machine helps you see how things can be associated in a way um, that makes a certain amount of sense which I, I think has been the huge thing in the automotive business well I've got again I've got, I, I got so many references I mean I think one of the things that was really enlightening for me uh, again was it was another book I read called um, <laughs> you're gonna laugh at the title it's called surrounded by idiots yeah. and you know, the book guilty. implies. I'm holding up my hand. I'm guilty. Yes, exactly. The book <laughs> implies that everybody on planet Earth feels like everybody else is an idiot. Why don't they ever get it? Right. Um, but really, what it's actually talking about is the fact that people are so centered on themselves and in their own processes that they're actually not aware that there are many other types, and it's right. kind of working together that is what makes it all kind of fundamentally work. Um, the reason I bring that in there is because, you know, there are so many different aspects to where there is value outside of this. I think it really takes a dualistic brain to comprehend and how to manage exactly what it is that you just brought up. You need the math side of your brain at the same time. You need the creative and linguistic side of your brain to understand how to apply the math fundamentally on a creative level so that when you're determining constraints, you design um, scripts and uh, you, you leverage computation with whatever tool you use to be able to study and evaluate so many different things because it could be used to determine um, you know the most proficient and efficient effective way of distributing program in a building it could be used to understand uh, operationally what uh, sorts of means and methods and equipment can you use to reduce the overall capital expenditures of, on an ongoing basis of how your building will operate year to year in terms of how much energy consumption you'll have. Like the spectrum differs and, and to the extent that how much is the material actually going to cost uh, in one design scenario versus another. I, I think I mentioned last time we did uh, or I did uh, set up a, a computational script to analyze and determine uh, what impacts uh, choosing a different design approach material materiality wise but also performance wise um what was your priority a, a driving factor in developing the facade of a building right and um so so we worked with uh, cost consultants uh hanscom i believe um was a cost consultant i was working with and so we used yardsticks as a basis but then worked very closely to understand the regional cost right if you've got um say a facility that is a uh, uh, you know district energy uh driven right so you want to be as economical as possible but you still want to be able to generate energy right it's it's its goal was to be carbon neutral or to be extremely efficient and you're going to build these things all across the country you want to know but the cost to build that thing in Halifax is different to build the cost of that thing in none of it. And it's different to build the cost of that thing in Toronto or Mississauga, right. Or Ottawa. Right. Um, and so these are the sorts of things. And it's like, do you want to harmonize that cost? You just want to know what the out is at least so that you can make a decision and, and, and make a basis claim on what your strategy is. But these are the things that we leave on the table that we're not thinking of when we don't use both aspects of the brain. And I think it's, we're not built that way. I think, um, typically, but these are the sorts of things that I think we need to explore. 
Well, yeah, so I, I agree completely that that you, you need to use both sides of your brain, but you need to use the middle of your brain too, yeah. where you're actually going out and finding stuff out. Right. Like in California, you can't build a hospital unless you go through OSHPOD, which right. is the Office of Safety and Health for Hospitals or something. So uh, they require that a hospital be standing and operational for like 60 days after a major earthquake. And so every air handler that is put into a uh, hospital in California is put on the shaker table at Oshpod to see if it can withstand how long it'll last in like a Richter seven earthquake. Right. So, so we get data from that. That data about the performance of that air handler could be made available for the performance of air handlers everywhere. Agreed. I mean, we test these things all the time. UL, you know, Universal Lab, they yeah. test these things to see if they work, right? It's, it's, you know, is your toaster going to electrocute you? Right. <laughs> well, it's UL certified. So no, you don't have to worry about that. But why don't we take that information and put that into our FIM, you know, our facility information model right. so that we are thinking about how we're going to maintain this. So what are we buying? Not just like the cheapest thing off the shelf, but what is the thing that gives us the most value? And I think it returns to the value proposition that, that we forget about defining a value proposition before we start undertaking anything in our business. And there are some very smart, there are some very, very smart people working on um, some exceptionally uh, complex, but also effective solutions in the industry. Like, it, you know, like it, I always find myself, I haven't, I haven't even found like a really good replacement and I hate to like actually like name drop specific companies and things like that. But like, if you look at what IBM is doing with Maximo um, and, and just like strategically, if you look at IBM, like big blue, like 50 years ago, you see yeah. them now, it's like, it's crazy. Like I actually really love what they've done by reinventing a company of that scale and being in all the areas that they're in. Right. Um, right. But you know, the concept and the notion of how complex and how detail oriented you can be in understanding, you know, every aspect of your facility. I really think that, you know, again, back to the whole BIM connection is that we're, you know, to do that as a, a post rationalization is you're really missing a lot of opportunity. Like, I think it's, it should be part of the whole process, right? Part right. of that process should be integrating the notion of, of what it is you're doing on the back end right. up front. Uh, I use the analogy this morning. I had, I had a meeting with some of my colleagues where, you know, I was suggesting that, I mean, it's, it's rather maybe gross. And if you're not a meat eater or a vegan, <laughs> then probably will detest my analogy, but you know, it's a notion of like being a hamburger, right? You've got the, the buns and then the meat in the middle where I was like suggesting that the whole design process through construction is the meat in the middle and perhaps the bottom of the bun is, you know, the initial stages of investigation, sorting things out, defining parameters, uh, the framework for you working within, then the meat is the execution and then the top bun maybe layer is the, uh, you know, the operations thereafter, um, how you manage that. And I said, why are we not all parts of that equation? You know, we, we, right. we persist to keep, to keep ourselves as the meat, but they're, yeah. you know, or the pickle there's, guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is even worse, right? Yeah. Or the condiment, right? If you um, really eat a pickle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but I mean, I, the thing is, is that I think, you know, it's um, one of those things. And, and I was, I think I was formerly slayed for suggesting this, but, you know, I suggested that, it, um, and you, you and I were discussing this prior to even starting the conversation about like, you know, what is the future? And I, you know, I have some interesting ideas, but I think part of the future though, and, and whether we like it or not, whether like professionals, constructors, clients, uh, or uh, owners, I think, I, I think, and, and there are some examples of where this has rung true and there's been attempts. I just don't think we've, we've gotten there quite yet. Um, I mean, a failed attempt, I would argue is Katera, but not quite what I'm suggesting is that they will all be one. So I can imagine a scenario where the owner, the constructor, the professional services are one entity right. um, where everything is kind of connected and works in a vertical, but not for a very, very long time for obviously a number, a, a multitude of reasons. Right. Um, but I think, you know, if you want to drive construction down um, and you kind of want to cut out everything and be as effective and lean as you potentially can be, you kind of have to be that closely knit 
to right. do it really, really well, right? Yeah. So that it's and, all connected. And so I, I know some of the Katera folks, and I, I know that, that the thing that they didn't count on was how firmly embedded culture was in each of yes. these different companies. 100%. And culture is the killer. It's also the secret, right? So it's it's the double, it's, it's like um, penicillin. Yeah. You know, it can be hugely beneficial, but it can also kill you if you're allergic to it. Right. Um, and 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 the uh, whole the whole idea of what the what the future holds for us, and as you start thinking about like structural things, and you know, trying to get to be um, kind of one entity, and thinking about you know how we produce things and stuff. Um, the one of the things we talked about last time was that the future might be like a common library of icons that are all priced in real time so yep. that you can actually add the pricing dimension without, I mean, that would be a, a governmental function that could be spectacular. Canada is small enough to be able to do something like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's where the uh, National uh, Community on Excellence or whatever they call that thing um, could tend to. But what are the, in the last few moments here, what are the, what are the sure. things in the future that you're really, a lobbying for, hoping for, praying for in the back of your brain, you go, God, we should be able to do this. Why can't we do that? So, I, uh, yes, I, thanks for bringing that up. Um, part of that, actually, I just wanted to very quickly mention is I, and I'm not going to mention the name of it or not, but um, I recently put forth an application with a collection of uh, other companies to do kind of what you just mentioned, which is um, to get some research funding into developing some systems and strategies using a whole bunch of different technologies to be able to pilot uh, the notion of merging all of those elements together, as I had might have just suggested, which kind of brings me to the final aspect of things. I don't want to get into and even mention the word, but I think, you know, there's a buzzword that's floating around right now and, and developing parallel virtual universes. I'm not even going to use the word because I'm so over it already. But um, you know, there's a lot of talk about that. And, you know, what is a place like that? If you've ever seen Ready Player One, you probably know what I'm talking about. And I think, you know, if I'm going to use my best case scenario, thankfully, I've always been on the right side of history, I guess, if that's a term, in assessing and guessing these sort of things, is that it's not so much the virtual or the resistance to the virtual and maintaining physical and really kind of like doubling down on the existing culture, but it's more long term about the hybridization of both universes. And again, this all comes back to Technology is a tool to facilitate and help us do things better. So for instance, like if I can describe a scenario, maybe to like just paint a picture for people that's maybe easier for them to understand. And this is something that we've seen, like we've seen this and people are working on this right now um, is we just don't have all the devices to do it, but to show up and, and engage with the world in both the physical realm, but also the data that is behind the physical objects that exist in reality that is accessible, but we can't see right now and how it's connected because we physically don't have a device to engage with it. Yeah, access, the, yeah. yeah the similar sort of scenario I imagine will happen through construction in the building industry through a number of unified means whereby, you know, when you Go, whether it's through glasses or contact lenses or some other means, maybe even screens that are like external to us, um, you know, a heavy degree of that will be overlaying the concept of like, you know, material uh, with the reality of what you're seeing in, in real life, right? And so looking at a structure on site that is partially complete, but being actually to see what the finished product is in reality by seeing that overlaid on top of augmented with yeah. what's happening right now. And it's, it's, the, it's the symbiotic relationship between the two realms that is the major advantage. And again, it's an assist for us, you know? It's like, you know, yeah. Kobe laying up Shaq, uh, yeah. sort of situation <laughs> where together it's an amazing combination right apart still probably pretty damn good but not uh, not perfection sort of thing yeah. um, and I think that's the future future uh, and we're not there yet because there's a whole bunch of other considerations as well because you know you're not going to have guys climbing scaffolding sitting on beams like those pictures you see from 1920s 30s New York where guys are having their lunches on steel beams because they're taking a break and they're welding stuff it's going to be robots crawling up buildings um, but you're going to be able to look at the robot crawling up the building and wonder if it's stopped. You're going to look at it and something's going to come up with a little red dot that's going to say, dude's malfunctioning. Somebody's got to take a look at that. 
right? Or you're going to get a notification on your phone that says, take a look up. You look up with your glasses, you look at it, and instinctively it says uh, one of the motors is blown out or there's, uh, you know, it doesn't have an oil changer, whatever it is, right? right. Um, it's, and it's it just- like my 2006 Saab the other night. Your brakes are blown and you broke your stability bars. Yeah. Oh, exactly. <laughs> and in a modern car, yeah. you can self-diagnose like that, no problem, right? Um, but there are so many aspects of that and yeah. so many places where we have to make the connection and have the foresight to see how those things are interconnected. And I think that's the greatest challenge in front of us right now. Um, and again, that just comes back to tying it all together. But I truly feel that like the future is, you know, the unification of information and a virtual space with a physical space. Yeah, this is this is very cool, actually, because I'm, I'm I think about, you know, we, we get people into uh, IPD contracts or design assist contracts, and right. we're talking about, you know, doing a constructability review. Well, so it, it's not that what they typically concentrate on is, well, could I build that? And they go, yeah, they figure out a way to build it, as opposed to, should I build that? Right. And I think that the, the awesome nature of this parallel universe, which reminds me of Haruki uh, Murakami, who is a yeah. Japanese author, who's written a number of books where parallel universes actually exist. Right. It's really it's fantastic if you like that kind of stuff. Um, to develop a parallel universe of how we should be building things. Right. We are constructing these things long before we go build them so exactly. that we are learning from what we have learned. We are taking lessons learned into a digital experience where they now inform what we should be doing. Like you could exactly. rebuild the building completely and take away all the mistakes and see how long it would have taken. Exactly, exactly. Because you have the foresight and the knowledge and the data and information <laughs> historically yeah. to assess context to make better decisions next time. And you're um, capturing that information. I mean, that's- In what, real time. It's what a real time. the contractors have to do, the construction <laughs> yes. people, the people who work in the field, that they got to capture that information. Yeah. And I think it's even as silly as, uh, you know, let's say you're leasing a space, right? Uh, right. I mean, you work for a company that has a lot of space and, and you've got a, you know, a client that's considering leasing like 10 or five floors or whatever in a building. Uh, and it's as stupid and silly as just saying, okay, push the thing on the side of your thing, load all my libraries. Somebody does a walkthrough with like, just like strictly corn shell. Right. Um, and you can just start to, you know, pinch and pick stuff and like put a whole bunch of stuff down right so you know your designer or your whoever it is that's assisting you can go with the client and do like a real-time run through right. of Isn't scenarios like? yeah, yeah. like what what is your true capacity here that you could actually utilize for this okay maybe this building doesn't work for us do you have another one you can show us right because as a matter of fact you got to go so far to get to the men's room right that you're going to be wasting a lot of time although steve jobs would argue that's the most the, the most important big distance in the building is going to the, the washroom because that's where you meet people and you have those collisions that result in innovation. And parking um, in the handicapped spot out front, but. <laughs> who knows? <laughs> yeah. Nobody says he was a, a great person. <laughs> he certainly left a contribution to it. Yes. No, I, um, I agree. And as you have with this podcast, my friend, thank you so much for taking your time. No I problem. really appreciate it. This was a, this was a great conversation. I think it really built on our conversation we had last time. So I think it's uh, even better. It was a lot better. Yes, I agree. The one that we had last time, which was, which was fantastic. And I'm sorry we missed it. It still says it's recording, so I guess we're okay. Um, yeah. We will see you around, uh, around the front porch when you get up to Ottawa. Uh, thanks. I really appreciate you having me out uh, and uh, being able to contribute to this process. Uh, it's a great thing that you're doing. And uh you know, like books, podcasts are the new books and they're a tremendous value to culture and the development um, and uh, ensuring that we're doing great new things. Uh, knowledge is power, right? So, and insight. So I appreciate yeah. what you're doing. And stories are the stories are the fabric of our myths, right? And myths is what build legends and legends are what we want to build. So Agreed. thank you, my friend, the legend, Mark Sichi, everybody. Big round of applause. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Dick. See you soon. Bye. Thanks. Bye.